Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about an IPO. And this IPO is set in India. It's a company called Zomato, an online food delivery company. Why am I interested in Zomato? Partly because I'm interested in young tech companies going public and partly because a lot of companies are watching Zomato in India. And these are young private tech companies that are planning to go public to see how the market reception to the company goes. So let's go and get the show on the road. This is an IPO that's high profile. It happened on July 14th of 2021. That's a market debut. And the attraction to investors is just the market size. The fact that India is a huge market because Zomato by itself is a company with modest revenues that's making losses. I'm going to value Zomato and I'm going to talk in general about the things I do that are in common across all IPOs and what might be different, if anything, for an Indian IPO. So let's set the stage. Zomato was founded in 2008 by Deepinder Goel and Pankaj Chada as Foodie Bay. That was the original name of the company. And they did it in response to something they were noticing in the office they were working at. They noticed that other people in the office were having difficulty ordering food online because they couldn't pull up menus online. So initially, all they did <clears throat> was they made soft copies of these menus and put them online for their office mates. And the response was so good, they said, hey, why don't we go bigger? They offered it to, to the rest of the market and the reception kind of took them by surprise. Since then, the company has grown, it's augmented what it did. And in 2010, they renamed the company Zomato and the tagline they gave for it is never had a bad meal. So with that lead in, let's talk about Zomato's business model. Zomato started originally as an advertising company. Restaurants paid Zomato to be listed on the Zomato platform. And that's how they got the bulk of their revenues till 2015, when they added food delivery to the mix. Today, the bulk of Zomato's revenues come from transactions on its platform. When food is ordered for either delivery or pickup, and the company keeps a percentage of the total order value for itself. That revenue slice is about 20 to 25 percent, and it's not just, not just Zomato. Swiggy, which is Zomato's primary competitor in the market, also keeps about that percentage of the order value. Zomato also offers a subscription model where about 1.5 million people be, uh, are part of what used to be called Zomato Gold, but it's now called Zomato Pro. What do they get in return for the subscription? They at least in theory get discounts on foods at restaurants and they get delivery times which are quicker than the rest of the, the, the people on the platform. And it, it delivers a fairly modest amount of revenues. It accounts for less than 5% of overall revenues in 2021. Finally, in 2018, Zomato acquired a company that allowed it to deliver food, and this is primary food to restaurants, you know, groceries, meats that restaurants need to cook, and it's called HyperPure, and that is, a, a, that is a small part of Zomato's overall revenue still, but it's a new part of the business. So you can see that Zomato is not just a food delivery company, at least its ambitions look like they're much broader. Now, as Zomato has grown, it's burned through a fair amount of cash and VCs have contributed the capital to allow them to keep this burn going. So if you look at this table, it lists out all of the investments that have made in, been made in Zomato by venture capitalists over the last 10 years. The very first one happened in September 2011 and the very first VC to be in, invested in Zomato was InfoEdge. It still remains Zomato's biggest single investor, but you can see early on InfoEdge was a big player in the Zomato game. Recently, it's Cora and Tiger Global that have taken front place. But over the last 10 years, the company has raised about 144 billion rupees in venture capital money, which come, you know, in dollar terms, about $2 billion. Now, much of that capital that's been raised by Zomato has gone into investing in the company, and many of these investments have been acquisitions. This table, I list some of the acquisitions or all of the acquisitions that I could find that Zomato's made over the last 10 years. The most recent ones have been Uber Eats, which has been Zomato's biggest acquisition in its history, costed $206 billion or $206 million or $15.25 billion and Fitso, which is a company which, uh, which tells you a little bit about Zomato's ambitions being broader than food. Now, finally, if you look at Zomato's shareholder base pre-IPO, it reflects the amount of capital they've had to raise over the last 10 years to get to where they are today. 
In fact, the, the, there are a couple of things that stay, that jump out at you when you look at this this pie chart of who the shareholders were in Zomato pre-IPO. Notice that InfoEdge, with 18.7% of the shares, has the largest single stake in the company, reflecting its early VC investments in Zomato. Uber is the second largest investor at 9.19%, and Uber's holding of Zomato comes from that acquisition of Uber Eats India, because when Zomato bought Uber Eats India, Uber got in return for selling Zomato, Uber Eats India, they got a portion of Zomato. Now, as you look across the rest of the slices, notice that deep in the call, one of the founders is down to 5.55%, which tells you that the founder's ownership stake in the company has been diluted as they've gone for more growth and more capital. Now, the driver of Zomato's attraction is not so much where the company is today, because as I said, its revenues are modest and it's losing money. It's that Indian, the Indian food delivery market has lots of potential. I know that's a word that can be dangerous, but let's talk a little bit about where this potential comes from. This table, I'm com I've compared the food delivery market in India to the food delivery market in, the ch in China, in the United States, and the EU. Now, if you look across these markets, you can clearly see that India is the smallest of the four markets in terms of food delivery. It was about 50, if, if you look at the total number of users and the size of the market, 4.2 billion. I'm doing everything in US dollar terms so you can compare them. 4.2 billion in 2019. That dropped off in 2020 because of COVID to 2.9 billion with about 50 million users. And compared to China, the US and EU, you can see the market is small. In fact, the largest food delivery market in the world is China, now, which uh, now covers about 450 million users and about $110 billion in 2020. In fact, you notice that India and the EU saw a drop in food delivery in 2020, but the US and China saw an increase, and the US saw a huge increase in the food delivery market. Now, when you look across these markets, you can see why the Indian market is much smaller. There are three big factors driving why the Indian market is smaller than the rest. The first is per capita income. If you look at the per capita income for, for India, it's way below what it is for China, the US and the EU. So that's one factor. Because without the per capita income, you're not going to order out as much food. And without ordering out food, you're not going to get that many restaurants. It's a vicious cycle. So first is per capita income. The second is online access. Indian online access is much better than it used to be a decade ago. But at 43%, it's still lower than China, which is at 63%, which in turn is lower than the US and EU, which are closer to 90%. So digital access is lower. So lower per capita income, lower digital access. And there's a third factor, which I think needs to be brought into consideration, which is no, not all of these regions, uh, you know, people who live in these regions, not all of them are eager to eat out as much as people in other regions. For, uh, for instance, if you look at China, clearly the Chinese are much more willing to eat out than Indians are, even if you control for difference in per capita income. So the, the, the degree to which people are open to eating out varies across the world. I'm very reluctant to give anecdotal evidence about this because for two reasons. One is anecdotal evidence, it's just that, anecdotal. And second, it's anecdotal evidence about my times in India, which are so long ago that I don't even remember those times that well. And it's a throwback in time. But I do remember that when I was growing up, and I grew up in Chennai, which is, as many of you know, one of the most conservative parts of India, uh, my grandmother had never eaten at a restaurant in India in all of her life. And it's not because she couldn't afford it. She just wouldn't do it. She said, why would I want to eat out at a restaurant when if I can afford it, I can have somebody at home prepare food exactly the way I want it and I feel safe. Now, I know things have changed in India over the last 50 years, but there is this degree of not wanting to eat out that you've had to overcome that has, hasn't been true in other markets. So lower per capita income, less digital reach, and eating habits vary across the world. Just to show you how eating habits can affect market size, here's what I did. I took the Indian market and adjusted it for income and digital reach to see what the size of the market would be relative to China. So let's assume that per capita income in India catches up with per capita income in China that internet access in, in India catches up in internet access in China. So if you look at 
Indian per capita income at 100% of Chinese per capita income and China level internet access, the market you get for India for the food delivery is about 32 billion. 32 billion. That's not the 110 billion. So even if India had the same per capita income and digital access as China does, the total market would be only 32 billion, not the 110 billion you see in China. If you have US level internet access, the market would get a little bigger. But basically this is something that needs to be kept in mind. You think about how big can the Indian food delivery market become? So let's turn our attention to Zomato. To value Zomato, I turn to the prospectus just as you need to for any other IPO anywhere in the world. And I'm going to say some things about the Zomato prospectus that I could probably have said about any tech company prospectus anywhere in the world. The first, if you open up the Zomato prospectus, it's 420 pages long. You're saying, how the heck do they get to 420 pages? Well, let me give you a start. The prospectus starts with 17 pages of abbrevi abbreviations of terms, some of which are obvious. They you know, define terms like board of directors, shareholders. If you need those terms, define what the heck are you doing even thinking about investing. Some of which are meaningless even when expanded. There are 19 classes of preferred shares and guess what? Even if you expand all of them, I couldn't care less. And some of them are the names of other companies. 17 pages. There's 30 pages of risk profile. In an earlier session, I talked about how useless this section has become in most uh, prospectors. If you don't believe me, read the Zomato risk profile section. 30 pages with 69 different risks listed out. I'm going to challenge you to read that section and list out three, three, just three out of the 69 that you think matter. I couldn't find them. Finally, for a company that's only 13 years old, Zomato has acquired an incredible number of subsidiaries and holdings. Many of these subsidiaries are 100% owned by Zomato, which tells me there must be legal or tax reasons for these holdings, but they do add about 50 pages of table after table of these subsidiaries that you really can't make head or tail of. Now, with that said, there are there are financials in the company and you can get a sense of what the company's been doing at least in the recent past. The prospectus itself lists out 2000, the fiscal year ending March 2019, March 2020 and March 2021. I've added the March 2018 numbers and you can look at the evolution of the company over time. So I've started with gross order value which are the orders placed on the platform and the portion of those gross orders that Zomato shows as its revenues. Because Zomato doesn't get to keep the entire order, they just show their 22 or 25 percent slice of the order. So you can see that revenues grew substantially between 2018 and 2020. Then because of COVID, the revenues did drop off in the fiscal year ended 2021. The company's never made money. In fact, its losses decreased in the fiscal year end of 2021, partly because things slowed down. They spent much less on SG&A expenses. There was interest expense. Clearly, the company has debt, but they have interest income that more than covers interest expense. So it's not a, it, it, this is not a company where debt is going to bring it down. But the bottom line is this is a money losing company that's been losing more and more money over time. And the only reason it looked less, the losses decreased in 2021 is because things slowed down. Now, of course, Zomato is very clear to make the case that what happened in the fiscal year 2021 was because of COVID. And one way they show this is by breaking the, the gross order value. This is the total orders on the Zomato platform by quarter. So what I've listed here are the, uh, the 2020 fiscal year quarters. So these are fiscal year quarters, not calendar years. So the fourth quarter of 2020, the fiscal year, is actually the first quarter of the calendar year 2020. So it's a little confusing, hang in there. So if you look at the comparison, the, the third and the fourth quarters of 2021, which will be the last quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021, the calendar years, you can see the comeback. From COVID. It's not complete. Obviously, things the shutdown is not completely over. But the case the company is making is what you saw in the fiscal year 2021 is because of COVID. Now, in terms of unit economics, which is what a typical order looks like and how much money you know the Zomato makes, Zomato paints a pretty optimistic picture of what's going on. So if you look at this graph, this looks at fiscal year 2020, which ends in March 2020, and fiscal year 2021, what a typical order for Zomato brings as inflows. So the blue columns are inflows, 
and what it takes out outflows. So you look at 2020, the outflows exceed the inflows. In fact, per order, Zomato lost 30 rupees, the 30.5 rupees per order in, tw in fiscal year 2020. In fiscal year 2021, the orders got bigger, the outflows got smaller, and the biggest news here, if you believe these charts, is the marginal profit of the order went from minus 30.5 rupees to plus 20.5 rupees. Things look, look better, at least on a per order basis. The caveat I would offer is that's just one fiscal year. Now, whether that will continue going, coming out of COVID, we're going to have to wait and see. Now, what's Zomato's biggest competitive advantage? It's the networking benefit that many companies like Zomato, intermediary companies, are pointed to. In fact, what I've done here is taken a chart of the Zomato Prospectus and compared it to a chart that I found in the Uber Prospectus to show you how much these companies draw on the same argument. And here's the basic argument that as these companies grow, it gets easier for them to grow. In fact, growth creates more growth. There's a virtuous cycle. So as you get more delivery transactions, there are more restaurants and you have more restaurants, there are more customers and more customers create more delivery and the cycle just feeds on itself. So it's a, it, it, and I've, I've, I, you know, I've no problems with the cycle. I've seen how effectively it delivers growth at companies like Uber and Airbnb. But guess what? None of these companies have been able to establish. These network pictures are good stories for why these companies can grow quickly, but they're not stories for these companies making money. In other words, we need something else in this story to create profitability. And neither Uber nor Zomato have shown me that piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to try to value Zomato. And here are my story pieces. In terms of the total market, as you saw in the earlier graph, the market in India is small and held back by low per capita income, limited digital access and eating habits of Indians. I think that the Indian food delivery market will grow. But I think the end game here, especially if you look 10 years out, is I find it hard to see this market exceeding 40 billion. I don't think this market is going to be like the Chinese market because Indian eating habits just are very different from Chinese eating habits. So my best estimate would be somewhere between 20 to 30 billion. Let's shoot for 25 billion, market of about two billion. You know, you know if, if you think about you know, how much this means in terms of Indian rupees, it's about you know, 1,800 to 2,000, not trillion, but billion Indian rupees. That was a typo. In terms of market share, I do agree with the arguments made by Zomato that, that like every other food delivery market in the world, this is going to be a market where you're going to end up with two or three big players. It's a natural outgrowth of that networking benefit story that as a company gets bigger, its market share will get more and more difficult to attack. But I still don't see that market share exceeding 40%. I don't think this is going to be a monopoly. It's going to be an oligopoly at best but perhaps even three or four companies, especially given the diversity of the Indian food re delivery market relative to the Chinese food delivery market. The regional difference in India tend to be much bigger. So I think a market share of about 40% is about the best you can hope, is, is about what you should hope for. In terms of the percentage of the gross order value that Zomato would get to keep, that number was about 23.13% in the 2020 fiscal year, dropped to 21% in the 2021 fiscal year, which I'm willing to concede is due partially at least to the shutdown. But I think if it, you know, even if it bounces back, I think it's going to end up around 22%, partly because one of the competitors that Zomato faces is Amazon Food. And Amazon Food is accepting a smaller slice of the GOV, of the gross order value from restaurants, and that's going to put downward pressure. In terms of how much of those revenues will become operating margins, I'm willing to accept that this is going to become, in steady state, a profitable business because the, cost, the biggest cost that Zomato faces is selling costs. And as growth comes down, those costs should start to scale down. So I will assume a pre-tax operating margin of about 30%. Now, no, no company can grow without reinvesting. And for those of you who point to this as a tech company, remember Zomato's had to reinvest immense amounts in acquisitions and its platform. I don't think that's going to stop, but I do think that in the near term, the acquisition of the Uber Eats platform will give them some breathing room. So at least in the near term, they're going to be able to get much more revenues per dollar of capital. 
and I'm going to build that into the reinvestment through a sales to capital ratio. So in 2021, coming out of the COVID, that, that's going to be, they, they're going to get a bigger, bigger, bigger payoff in terms of revenues for a dollar of capital. And I'm going to adjust that over time. Finally, in terms of risk, I think in terms of operating risk, I have to bring in country risk. Food delivery is not a particularly risky business because people need to order food. But I think the fact that it's an Indian company means that it's more exposed to Indian macro risk of growth in India, how well India does as an economy. And because it's a money losing company and it is going to burn through some cash, at least in the near term, there is a chance of failure. It's not high because the company you know, so is going to be raising a substantial amount of cash in its IPO that will allow it to cover its near term needs. But I think about a 10 percent chance of failure with those those assumptions built in. I value the company. So notice what happens. The total market which is about 225 billion rupees in 2021 will grow over time to hit almost 2 trillion. Now, 2 trillion in 10 years. The market share will, you know, right now Zomato is about a 41% market share. I think it'll stabilize around 40%. Amazon Food will continue to eat away at some of the market share. The margins improving will create you know, and 20, you know, 22% of those gross orders will turn out to be revenues. The revenues that I see for Zomata will go from about to, uh, close to 20 billion in the most recent fiscal year to almost 173 billion in, um, ten, um, in 10 years from now. And as the margins improve, the, the operating income gets delivered. And, and you can look at the free cash flow. The company is a cash burner for the next four years but it turns the corner by year five. And much of the cash the company has to burn through, it already is raised because you know, Zomato's plans are to raise about nine, 90, you know, if you look at the 90 billion rupees in its initial um, IPO as cash to hold in the company. And that's going to cover much of what the company needs to reinvest at least for the near term. So using those assumptions, if I value the company, the value that I get for the operating assets, now adjusted for distress is about a hundred. You know, it, it, it is about three. It's close to four hundred billion. You just certain there's not much debt to subtract out. A big chunk of the value will come from cash holding. It will come from the cash that the company raises. I have to subtract out the options the company has granted. Divide by the number of shares. The value per share that I get is about forty one rupees per share. Now, the offering price that was being talked about that the company was going public at was about 72 to 75. But with my story, the value that I get for the company is closer to 41, 41 rupees per share. Now, you know, that's not a, you know, I'm, I'm telling a fairly upbeat story of success. But even with that upbeat story, I find it hard to get to $72. Now, if you're probably, if you're wondering, whether I could be wrong on my assumptions, let me set your mind at rest. I'm definitely wrong. In fact, I'm going to be horribly wrong on some of these assumptions. But the best way to deal with uncertainty is to face up to it. And as some of you who've seen some of my early evaluations know, one of my favorite techniques for facing up to uncertainty is a Monte Carlo simulation. And in this picture, I've actually created a Monte Carlo simulation where I've taken what I think are my three big assumptions, how quickly the Indian food delivery market will grow, what Zomato's market share of that market will be and what Zomato's margins will be in steady state. And based, uh, and I made them into distributions. So for instance, I allow the Indian food delivery market to be as large as 40 billion or as low as 10 billion. The market share to range from 15 to 40, 40%. And the operating margins to be anywhere from, you know, my base case margins were 30% anywhere from, in this case, 15 to 45%. 15% would be what you'd expect to see if Amazon food essentially becomes very aggressive in cutting costs and going after the market. And 45% might be what they settle into if the end game is Zomato and Swiggy, kind of come to an implicit agreement to maintain profitability. With those assumptions, I get a distribution of value per share. And you can see my median value is about 36 rupees per share close to the, you know, a little lower than the 41 rupees. But there's something worth looking at when you look at this table. If somebody's buying shares at 72 to 75 rupees, I'm not going to call them crazy. It's plausible that you could get up to that value. I wouldn't buy at that price, but perhaps your story is much bigger than mine. 
If nothing else, simulations are a way of taking hubris out of the equation, of learning that there are different stories out there at play, and your story is not always the one that wins. Now, of course, one of the most dangerous moments after you value a company are what I call those things that happen right after you finish evaluation, where people on both sides, people who think you've come up with too low a value, too high a value, throw things at you, not physical things, but things that they hope will add to a premium or create a discount. So I want to talk a little bit about some of those add-ons and distractions. Let's start with an argument that I think has some resonance, which is that I'm not valuing Zomato's platform adequately in my valuation. I mean, Zomato's platform is going to have tens of millions of users in steady state. Now, now, I value them as a food delivery company, but to the extent that those users on your platform, if you can find other things to do, do with them, other products, other services you can offer, there's an option ad here. And that option ad should add to a premium over the 41 rupees. Now, before we get too excited about the option ad, two things to note. First, not all platforms are created equal. Some platforms are worth more than others. I give the contrast between the Facebook platform, which I like, and I've, I, I'm an investor in Facebook because I think its platform is value, to the Twitter platform. The Facebook platform has billions of users, two, two and a half billion if you count WhatsApp and Instagram. And those users spend a lot of time on Facebook, which means that Facebook has more time to sell them products and services. Twitter's platform is more transitory. Now, Zomato's platform is not as good as Facebook. People don't spend time on the Zomato platform, spending hours posting to other people. They spend their time on the Zomato platform for a specific purpose, to create a transaction, to order food delivery. So Zomato is clearly not as lucrative a platform as Facebook is. But even if you believe there's optionality, you know, attaching a value to that option is difficult. In the Facebook case, I said, look, I'm not going to value this platform, but I'm going to think of it as an add-on to my in intrinsic value. So while I found Facebook to only be mildly undervalued on an intrinsic value basis, the presence of this option is what allowed me to invest in Facebook. In the case of Zomato, I think the platform is value, but will it double the value? I don't think so. It's not that type of platform. And I think the platform is going to have value on food-related products and services. So if Zomato started grocery deliveries, I think it has a chance of succeeding. If Zomato tried retailing apparel, I don't think it's going to work that well. On a second distraction, I think you truly have to think of it as a distraction. And what is that? Indian and Chinese companies, especially young and growing businesses, have this bonus, which is they cater to huge potential markets, a billion plus people. And as a consequence, analysts and investors say, why not add a premium to these companies because the market is big? You know why you shouldn't? Because if you've done your job right, your number should already reflect it. Take a, look, take a look at the Zomato valuation. Part of the reason I give them the growth that, they, that I give them is because they're in the Indian market. The market is going to grow fast because of the population. It's a potentially big market. I've already counted that in the growth rate. I've already counted that in the margins and the cash flows. If I put a premium in, I'd be double counting. In fact, I think when you have big markets like India and China or AI or any other big market, I think the danger you face is that you actually overvalue companies. And here's why. I call this the big market delusion. I've written about it before. When you see the big market, you think of, you know, you, you see stars in terms of growth. What you don't factor in is big markets attract other companies equally attracted to the same big markets. And guess what? Before you know it, competition kicks in, margins drop off. Big markets are not always profitable markets. And I think with Zomato, I am giving them the benefit of both being in a big market and profitable. So I'm already counting in a big market premium. Now, of course, anytime you do an intrinsic valuation of a company like Zomato, the question you get asked is, why bother? I mean, I've heard people say, values in the eye of the beholder. I think that we need to replace a word in that statement. Value is not in the eye of the beholder. Price is in the eye of the beholder. And you could argue that IPOs, you're playing a pricing game. In a pricing game, what do you do? You look at what other people are willing to pay for companies like Zomato, and then you attach a pricing to Zomato. That's kind of tough to do with Zomato because the only other company that is 
No, that's similar to the model Swiggy, and Swiggy is not publicly traded. They say, what about DoorDash? DoorDash is a US company, different market, different kind of company. But it's in fact the only food delivery company I can think of that would remotely be comparable. So what I've done in this table is compared DoorDash to Zomato. And you know, I've computed you know, four multiples. And in fact, I couldn't think of any more that I could compute. You know, and I'll talk a little bit about why I've computed enterprise value of each company divided by gross order value, enterprise value to revenues, enterprise value to gross income, enterprise value to user. You saying, why aren't you doing PE ratios, EV to EBITDA, EV to EBIT? You know why? Because they're money losing companies. Now, if I look at the current numbers, it looks like DoorDash is cheaper than Zomato on almost every multiple except enterprise value to user. And herein lies the dangers of pricing to the degree that you have preconceptions about a company. You love a company, you hate a company. You're going to find a pricing justification, right? So if you want to justify Zomato being cheap, you know what you're going to point to? Enterprise value per user. You're saying Zomato is so much cheaper than DoorDash. In fact, if you really want to make the game look better for Zomato, rather than divide by 2020 numbers, divide the current enterprise value by 2030 forecast. I know you're reaching, but because Zomato is far more growth than DoorDash, the company looks far better if you use forecasted values. So what does it all mean? It doesn't mean that pricing is useless, but it does mean that if you're doing pricing rather than intrinsic valuation, and hoping that this means you're not biased, you're barking up the wrong tree. Bias is going to find its way into your judgment, whether you do valuation or pricing. Which brings me to one final distraction. I know that in the aftermath of the Zomato offering being, being publicized, there were a lot of people who argued that, you know, who almost dismissed the company. Their argument was actually a very simple one. How can a money losing company be worth money? Really? This is the emptiest argument I've ever heard. For a company to be worth money, it, it has to be making money right now. That's not true. In fact, if you're one of those value investors who adopts rigid investing rules, that you will not buy if a stock trades at a PE ratio greater than 15, or an EV to EBITDA ratio that exceeds eight, you would never buy a company like Zomato. But how has that worked out for you for the last decade, or even the last 20 years? If you avoid young money losing companies, you're going to be also avoiding some of the greatest investments you could make over the next 20 years. And you know what? The biggest reason Zomato is losing money is not because it's badly managed and badly run, but because of where it's in the life cycle. I agree with you. There are questions about its business model. And if the reason you don't want to invest in Zomato is because you don't think its business model holds up, I'm all with you. But don't reject Zomato just because it's a money losing company. Which brings me to my conclusion. I know that when you teach valuation, one of the questions you get asked is, hey, all of this works for developed market companies. Does it work for emerging market companies? Or oh, you valued US companies, but I have to value an Indian company. Can you tell me what to do? Here's my advice. The first principles of valuation are the same in all markets. Your practices have to vary. You have to adapt to what you have. And I valued Zomato using exactly the same process that I used to value DoorDash. Do I have issues with Zomato's disclosures? Absolutely, but many of those issues I had with DoorDash as well. I agree, Zomato is a money losing, cash burning machine right now, but it is promised. Promised because it looks at, it, it's looking at a really, potentially a really large market. And it's on path to delivering a viable business model. Doesn't mean there won't be challenges along the way from competitors, from what happened to the economy. But at the right price, I would buy Zomato. I mean, at $72 to $75, I think the stock is overpriced, but if it were priced at 40 or 45 rupees per share, I would definitely buy it. Did I say $72? 72 rupees per share, it's clearly overpriced. But if it were at 30 or 35 over 40, I'd buy it with the hope that the optionality will add a premium there. I do, do agree that investing in Zomato, you're making a joint bet, a bet on the company and its management and its competition, and a bet on India as a country, its growth and eating habits. I know, and you've got to walk in with that full understanding when you invest in this company. I hope you found the session useful, and thank you very much for listening.